let's see if we can bring this up online. Make sure our cameras are working. Looks good. Should be pretty good. Let's see the live button here. All right. Oh, hey, mom. See now you get to watch a a live art session. Okay, so this is uh, gonna be for the San Diego Comic Con uh, exclusive. Actually, I need to make a a change over here, so I'm gonna change that that's going to be a mystery part that's going to be added right at the end it's a little extra special part of that patch so i'm just going to block that out and then hopefully whoop, uh, just bringing up my ipad here so i can see people's comments and everything and see if this is uh, uh thanks everybody for Joining in, uh, swipe left. Let me see if I can see. Okay, I'm just seeing if I can see comments here. Okay, that's what I wanna be able to see in case somebody has questions, so. Um, so, this is, uh, this is a, a piece I did a, a prelim for a while back, uh, and I asked uh, Brian Polito, I said, hey, I wanna do something with kind of a, a rock and roll theme, if you will, and so, um, I decided to, uh, oh, I need to turn off my sound here in the background so I can't hear myself. So give me just a sec. Yep, there we go. Okay. I needed to mute the iPad so I wasn't uh, getting a reverb. Okay, should be good now. Uh, looks like the iPad is up to date and tracking well. Uh, I'm not sure that the... The one over here on my computer is quite up to date, but that's okay. We'll just use the, the iPad part as far as being able to see. Hey, Brandy, what's going on? See, you get a little Coffin Comics preview here, which, you know, was approved by the, the Master Fiend himself to let the cat out of the bag, so to speak. Uh, yeah, so anyway, we're going to get into some art here. So the stage that you're seeing currently is a combination of both colored pencil and marker. So what I do is I've got my, my arsenal of black colored pencils. Uh, there's other grays and things that I would have used as well. Uh, and I start out building the drawing once the sketch is approved. So the sketch is a, is a smaller pencil sketch. Uh, I actually happen to have it right here. So there wasn't too many changes to uh, the original concept. Uh, this is the original sketch that I sent to uh, Brian, and uh, we decided to go ahead and lose the sunglasses so she wasn't trying to look over that. Uh, and then I decided to move the jacket over to the, the other side. Uh, but other than that, remains, you know, uh, not super changed. Everything is kind of pretty similar, as you can see there, uh, for approval of just kind of the concept of all of that. So that's a, a pretty detailed rough. Uh, there's quite a bit of time that goes into one of those. They, they take about half a day to create. Uh, thank you, Brandy. Uh, everybody's comments, Angie and everybody. Uh, so I start out with the kind of blending. So I'm a believer that the stronger the drawing, the stronger the painting. A lot of people think, oh, well, I'm going to fix that in Photoshop. You hear that all the time. Oh, well, we'll just change that. You know, it's great for uh, changing colors and things like that. Say we wanted the background to be uh, purple instead of red. Yeah, those are, those are nice fixes in post to not have to do 
traditionally. I'll, I'll get it. I love that. I'm well versed in making those changes for uh, my uh, clients as well. But uh, I also care greatly about the quality of the artwork that I'm also uh, providing and offering to the fans. It's one of the main reasons why uh, you see here I'm working on this, you know, 17 by 22 inch piece of original art. And uh, it's, it's a valuable part of, of me making a, a living is, is selling original art. So uh, I want them to look uh, great on the cover when they're printed. And I want them to look uh, honestly even better in person for the people who uh, own the originals. Most of the time what I hear back when somebody arranges or uh, something arrives in person that they've bought, they say, you know what, the scan you sent me doesn't even do it justice. And you know that's what I love to hear and that's what drives me to create uh, art like this. Oh, go Monty or go home, I like that, Troy. <laughs> oh, Josh here in Colorado checking in, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, so there you go, so we're at this stage. Uh, I, I have it kind of taped in place, so I'm not gonna hold it up to the camera uh, because I, I don't want it to, to get out of focus for where you guys are. Um, but I'm gonna start doing some airbrushing here in a minute because I know people enjoy seeing that phase. Uh, and then, um, you know, we'll do, you know, an hour, hour and a half or something here tonight. Um, so if you have questions, I'll periodically look over and, and uh, check in. Otherwise, I'm just gonna keep doing my thing. Uh, so I'm gonna put the pencil down. And at any time during the process, because I work essentially dry, you know, I can come into the piece and if I say, oh, I want, you know, these hairs or this section back here, to you know, recede into shadow. Uh, I have such a variety of tools at my disposal from uh, colored pencils, I can use markers, I can use the airbrush, and with just a couple of strokes if I want to, I can start pushing some of those elements in the piece farther back or bumping up uh, the thickness of say the guitar if it's a trap line or something that goes around it. Um, but uh, by using the colored pencil or even if I was using hand paints, it allows me to get these really, really fine details in here for, say, the mesh that's on the amp. Uh, and I, you, I don't know if you probably noticed, you probably have, instead of saying Marshall here, <laughs> it says Monty Moore M3. I thought that was kind of fun. Um, so anyway, uh, I, that, those are some of the things that I like about the, the colored pencil being very detailed. Uh, I could, I've done underpaintings with watercolor, with acrylics. Uh, I, I try to just have a lot of different materials at my, uh, in my art arsenal, so to speak. So, uh, so there you have it. So I'm going to, I'm going to set this stuff down and we're going to pick up the, the airbrush here and I'm going to make sure I'm seeing everybody's comments. Okay. So I don't have anything in the airbrush yet. I am on, uh, the reason why you can't hear a, a compressor in the background is I'm using a big tank of compressed air, looks like a scuba tank. Uh, this is my airbrush. This is a Toricon TH-2, uh, made for Holbein, one of the, the uh, oldest paint companies in the world. They're over, uh, I think they're 100 years old already, 109, something like that. Uh, I have been using this style of airbrush for uh, over 20 years, since 1993. I've been using this company's, uh, actually 90, 1990, uh, this type of uh, airbrush, which allows my cup to move to any position I want. So if I'm working flat or if I'm painting a mural on a ceiling, uh, the needle goes through the middle of the airbrush. It's a big, long thing. Looks like that. Has a, a real fine tip. You probably can't see that thing. Probably won't focus. But anyway, that's what the air forces the, the paint out of the cup, onto the needle, vaporizes it, and then puts it where I am painting. And uh, so there you have it. Now, uh, I could put uh, normally, so I have access to the needle. Uh, I don't keep the back on it, um, but this is the back piece that would typically be on it uh, that's for comfort. So we'll just put that back on. And then if you're a newbie airbrusher, uh, you probably want to put the, this cap on the front. That keeps you from banging the tip and damaging the needle. But uh, I like to see exactly where I'm going and it doesn't actually affect the air spray. So I don't use uh, a cover on it. Um, and yes, I have damaged dozens, if not, you know, hundreds of needles over the, the years. Um, 
but uh, that's just how I roll. Um, so I'm gonna put some cleaning solution. This is just good old fashioned Windex. And uh, we'll just put a little bit into the airbrush and uh, I'll just blow a little test pattern there. Make sure I've got good airflow. It's not being all weird. And uh, that way I can see what's going on. You can see a little bit of the, the flow coming across there. And then uh, I keep some, some water handy. I'll move this here in a minute, but uh, this is just a bottle for water. This is uh, some cleaning solution. And then I'm gonna grab some uh, paints back here. I'm gonna grab a dark gray and a, I'm gonna grab a black. And then I want a dark blue uh, to pump up the, the blacks and make them a little bit richer and kind of more midnight, if you will. So uh, I think this will probably do it for the moment. I'm gonna, I'll move these out of the way so that I don't whack them and put water all over my art. Oh, thanks, my man. Appreciate it. Got, looks like we had a pretty good crew watching tonight. So uh, sorry I've been out of practice with this. I've, I've been uh, doing so much art and working so many crazy hours that a lot of the time I just sort of forget to try to go live and make sessions and, and share this stuff with you guys. But uh, I do appreciate Brian allowing me to, uh, to share this particular piece and project. So um, what I'm going to do is... I think I want to start out with uh, some some darker blacks. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little bit of uh, my black here, which is the Aero Flash. Uh, this is Holbein, the same company who makes the airbrush. And uh, it's a pre-made paint. You want it to be about the consistency of milk. It's a liquid paint. And so you put a couple of drops of that. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a dark blue. This is an indigo. And I'm going to uh, put a few drops of that in my black so that basically I have a really dark blue instead of just black. Uh, and that actually just makes the, the blacks richer. Uh, there are some artists who never use pure black at all. Uh, and there are those who do. And it really just depends on personal artists. There's some who, uh, mo more with oil paints, I would say. Um, try to avoid a lot of the the blacks and that uh, because they are afraid that it uh, um, it deadens their their painting and uh, flattens it but you know you can always put a layer of uh, varnish and gloss and things like that over a painting so here we've got just a, a work uh, uh, cloth just a some paper towel and you wanna get a good test pattern going first and should be able to get really, really fine. If you have enough control and you've done it a couple decades like me, you should be able to get a line like that, which is pretty much like a pencil line. Pencil line or even smaller than some pencils. Uh, but it takes a ton of practice. It takes a, a, a lot of uh, control uh, and it takes a clean gun and a really good gun uh, to be able to do that. So uh, I don't recommend people rush right out and buy a $400 airbrush uh, to get started. You need to work your way up, but uh, it's sort of like if you want to be a professional car racer, you know, you're not going to win with the Prius. You might get good gas mileage, but you're going to get your ass beat. Um, so you got to, you know, you want to, to get into those upper levels, you need to invest in, uh, in better products. So um, we'll show you a couple of great things that the airbrush is uh, good for with not only just smoothing and blending. Uh, for example, in this area back here where um, uh, there, there's just a little bit of uh, variation because that was actually created with, believe it or not, colored pencil and marker. I'm just, I can come in with the airbrush and if there's just a little bit of strokes showing through, and just a little bit of inconsistency. All I've got to do is come in with the airbrush and just add some of this darker color I've got and it's gonna turn into a nice, smooth, jet black background. Uh, and uh, we'll, I'll be showing some hand shield techniques as well tonight. Uh, if you need something to spray against, get yourself a piece of paper. In this case, these are airbrush shields. They look like French curves. You can see there's lots of paint built up on there. 
But if you don't have the control to not get overspray on your character, uh, your main subject, and you don't want to mask it off with film, then just get yourself a piece of plastic or cardboard or cut your own shapes, and then that way you can mask off and not get overspray onto that. Um, due to the fact the, of the knowledge of using the hand shields uh, and having the control, I don't really have to uh, do masking anymore. I, I did a lot of masking the first 15 years that uh, I was airbrushing and uh, it, it taught me control but maybe a little too much reliance on that uh, and it can end up making the artwork be kind of stiff so to speak. And so uh, now I don't have to do that anymore because I have uh, enough skills to be able to do that. Uh, Josh says, that's how you can tell they're professionals. I would have dropped the gun, damage the needle, and, <laughs> uh, and spilled paint all of this before starting. <laughs> oh, thanks, Paul. Uh, black is technically not a color. Black is the absence of color. Thanks, smart ass. I appreciate it. But for this particular conversation, uh, I will discuss color as I see fit. Uh, but uh, if you feel like you want to be a smart ass, you can do that, I suppose. Uh, or maybe you can go teach a, a theory on Munson's color theory and we can break out the color theory book and then you can have really deep conversations on color theory. Uh, so anyway, at the moment, I'm just going, because I've got, uh, technically this is not black, this is dark blue. Uh, I'm just going to come into areas that are uh, in the, the background area and I'm, I'm working my way out. I, I don't want this front part of the, uh, of the fabric. I want it to be receding into shadow and much like you might see uh, uh, an artist or if I was working with oils, uh, you want it to be super subtle. And you can notice a big difference between the sketch where it looks like those folds are kind of right behind her head and doesn't have the same depth, that the painting now starts to have a lot more three-dimensionality to it. And um, uh, uh, it just allows everything to kind of start dropping back into shadow. Uh, now I'm gonna do the same kind of uh, work into her uh, the black areas of her outfit. And I don't have to worry about too much about leaving uh, perfect highlights and things like that because the very last stage that I do is getting on the effect that I'm after. But uh, what I'm trying to go for is a uh, large range of value. And value is how we consider lights and darks. You consider uh, pure white, is basically a value, you know, depending on how you want to consider value one, value 10. If you decide to call pure white a value one, pure black a, val a value 10, that one of the reasons that I think some of my pencil drawings are popular is I tend to have a much greater range of all 10 values in the art. And it, that visual contrast creates uh, more eye appeal and desirability in the art because of the the value range. And uh, so by coming into these areas of her stocking, I can create some nice roundness there. And, uh, you know, those areas, honestly, in the final painting, they may be actually a lot closer to done. Uh, I may not have to do a lot more to them. So uh, the more, my airbrush is being finicky, the more uh, detail and subtlety I get into all the various stages, actually the less airbrushing I end up doing. So that's why it's very much a mixed media illustration as opposed to somebody saying, oh, well, that's an airbrush piece. Uh, in a piece like this and in most of my cover paintings, uh, I would say, only about 10% is probably airbrush. I'm really just using the airbrush these days for tinting, uh, adding highlights and, and softening of colors and things like that. And uh, it comes down to the, we'll just call it the right tool for the job. And 
For many years, I relied on the airbrush too much when I was younger, and I probably didn't learn hand painting and other uh, skills until later, which is probably a bad thing. Uh, but it meant when I kind of came back to airbrushing and some of the fine art that I'm doing now, it gives me a very versatile skill set that not a lot of artists have to be able to hopefully use a lot of different tools in a mixed media manner uh, that is, it's kind of rare. I belong to a lot of airbrush groups. Most of the people in the groups are automotive artists. They paint uh, cars and guitars and skateboards and things like that. But very little of them have um, uh, any hand painting or illustration skills outside of the airbrush. We, we all want to be what we call airbrush artists and we want that label. And, you know, I would say in the last 10 years, I thought, why, you know, why did I want to be an airbrush artist? Why do I need that label? Why can't I just be an artist? Why do I have to be just a comic book artist or just a gaming artist? I'm satisfied with just being an artist. And so, um, what we find in, in art a lot of times is, is whatever uh, method that we get used to doing in, uh, uh, see I'm using the little shield here just to block off that part right next to the horn. Uh, whatever thing that we love doing, everybody gravitate towards that and they wanna be a master at that one thing. And um, so these days I try to just be an artist and, and uh, do uh, comics and gaming and logos and uh, fine art and Western art and sculpture design and try to be a little bit more like the artist from the Renaissance who could do a lot of things really well rather than just one thing. Doyle Davis, oh my gosh, what a blast from the past. My man Doyle there who's uh, checking in online was one of the very, very first collectors who ever bought art from uh, myself and my friends at, at our very first Comic Cons in San Diego uh, 26 years ago. And uh, that's just awesome to, to be able to connect and see art uh, and you checking in. I, I got goosebumps because when, when I see Doyle's name, I, I think, you know, with guys like that who uh, took a chance on a bunch of greenhorn, uh, wet behind the ears artists who didn't know which way was up, um, really helped, you know, careers and, and uh, um, honestly build confidence. And, uh, you know, it, it's also smart for, for collectors and things to support artists when they're young. You think, oh, well, you guys aren't good enough. I'm not going to buy your art. And what I tell people now is the problem is, is by the time you wait, if you wait 15 or 20 years and you're like, oh, yeah, well, I didn't want to buy your art back then, but I want to get some now. And you're like, well, you know, you could have got a painting back then for like 400 bucks. And it might not be as good as it is now, but, the, you know, but a painting that same size might then cost 4,000. And so uh, I, I give really big props and I try to take care of friends who were the ones that helped us along when we were young. Um, so uh, thanks everybody for, for chiming in. Uh, we're doing some, some airbrushing and some blending here on Miss Lady Death. And as I mentioned in the, um, uh, the opening description there, uh, this piece is going to be a uh, Coffin Comics exclusive. Uh, this will be one of the, I'm sure there will be probably many books. I don't know how many they will have, uh, but this is gonna be a Monty Moore exclusive. I'm sure it'll be limited to uh, probably a very small amount of copies that will be for the Denver comic, or not Denver, for San Diego. Denver and Phoenix will also have their own exclusives. I will be at both of those shows, probably nearby, hopefully, where um, Coffin Comics is. Actually, they'll be uh, nearly right next to me at Denver. Uh, I'll be sharing a little bit of my booth space with them so that we can all uh, hang out together and do cool stuff and have a fun weekend. So what I'm doing in those parts right there is I'm just coming in with my, I have kind of a dark, uh, a really dark blue. It'll come off more as a, as a, almost as a black. And I'm just adding some soft blending. 
to soften some of the edges, but also pump up the blacks. You'll notice that these areas in here that I've airbrushed into, they're not near as stark. Uh, they, you know, they might look kind of overt uh, when you're first doing the first stages and be like, wow, okay, that's, you know, that's not subtle at all. But right now what you're doing is, is you're softening edges and you're working in what you hope is uh, some subtlety. I'm not trying to airbrush heavy enough that I'm losing detail, but what I'm doing is, is I'm adding these softer, darker values and I'm pumping up the really deep parts of the shadow uh, of areas and you know blending them. So uh, if I wanna come in to where the guitar is, I can just softly put some of the blacks in there. Again, I'm not too worried if I lose some of the whites that are in there because I can still see them. And if I want to bring some of those back out, all I have to do is, is come back in with um, my uh, whites at the end and I can decide if I want uh, some of the pickups to have a little bit of uh, shine on them. You can still see that it's there, uh, but I'm just, I'm adding blending and subtlety uh, to the to the overall piece and part of the look that I go for when I'm working on pieces like this is I want it to be that when I'm done it's harder for the viewer to tell where one technique or medium starts and another one finishes because it's a layering process you know, it's not like I'm trying to mimic Photoshop. Remember, art like this has been around for thousands of years. So Photoshop is trying to mimic artists who are working traditionally by working in layers. Traditional artists did it way first. And basically what you're seeing is layer number three. The first layer was colored pencil. Then I did a couple hours of blending with the marker. Now I'm working on a third layer of airbrush and it's all gonna come together at the end with hopefully uh, a very polished piece of cover art. And uh, I just want it to be where uh, it's all very seamless uh, when, it's, when it's done. And since I'm more of a uh, illustrator, I want it to be tight. You know, I'm not, I'm not working highly interpretive or anything here. And uh, that's, what, that's what the fans want when it comes to, uh, to my artwork it, anyway. So, uh, Texas never gets any good stuff like this. What do you mean? Oh, as far as conventions. Well, I guess you'll have to uh, tell a Texas convention to, uh, uh, to have me out as a guest. I'd be happy to come to a show. I can hear my uh, air tank trying to screech here in the background a little bit. I'm not sure why it's being screechy. So I'm just gonna come in currently uh, kind of working down in the amp area and I'm just gonna add just a little bit of uh, darker blacks to create kind of a drop shadow around the, uh, around the bottom of the guitar. I don't wanna get rid of all of the painstaking detail that I put into the, the mesh where the fabric is. Uh, but the older you get as an artist and the more sort of seasoned, shall we say, you realize that sometimes you have to cover up your own work. And we have a tendency as artists to want to sort of like show off. Like how much detail can we cram in there? Did you notice I painted every single thread? Well, the thing is, is to create a really good piece of art you might have to think to yourself, well, I don't want them to look at every single thread because the sub the focal, the focal part of the subject is up there. So we still want all of this stuff down here to be complementary, and uh, it, it needs to add to the overall piece, still be detailed, but I don't want people looking and focusing on just that part of the piece, because that's not my focal point. So at times you just have to say, hey, I'm gonna get rid of some of that work that I did in there to benefit the overall piece of art. And so what if some of that earlier detail you put in 
ends up going away. That's just part of working more realistically. And by more realistically, I mean M-O-O-R-E. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. Uh, so right now, again, just, just adding a little bl blending. And you have to look in front of where I'm pointing. I realize that at times I'm blocking where I'm painting if I'm over it like this. Uh, but we're just trying to do the best we can here while still creating cool videos. Uh, but look, look in front of where the airbrush is, and then you'll see those darkening tones. Uh, it, it would be easier, you know, say I was going to put a little bit of darker area in that calf right there. I will do that more with grays, but it's a lot easier to see if I was currently working on, on that area. So I need to finish up a little bit of my mesh down here with the, with the, uh, the amp. Uh, Eric Johnson says, my wife wants to know if you can draw her Lady Death sitting on the throne of skulls. Uh, Rich has given the answer before I joined tonight, but how long have you been using airbrush in your work? Uh, see, there's, yeah, Doyle, <laughs> Doyle answered for me. <laughs> yeah, so I started, I got, my mom gave me my first airbrush uh, that I owned when I was uh, 17. I was a senior in high school, and I had been using hers for a little bit. Before that, uh, she had one, and my mom was an artist uh, of, of many mediums, so that's probably where I get a lot of inspiration. She did fine art, she did jewelry, stained glass, uh, she did uh, banners and things for the church, uh, you name it. Um, but yeah, I've been actively airbrushing and pursuing skills in airbrushing for um, the 30, what am I now? 48, 30, 49, somewhere in there. Um, I think I'm 48 now. So, uh, just a little over 30 years and, uh, I've never given it up. There, there's been times where, uh, I was working on my hand painting skills and things like that, uh, where I wasn't using it very much. And those were some kind of growing years for me. Um, uh, a, a long time friend and, and art hero of mine was Keith Parkinson and I had the opportunity to do an art workshop with him here in Colorado and he gave me a bit of advice and he said Monty I think you need to to touch your artwork more and because I was doing a lot of illustration that was not a lot of hand painting uh, I, I knew what he meant and he, he meant I needed to put brush to paper or pen or pencil a lot more and so for uh, sort of probably a year year and a half two years I didn't do a lot of airbrushing and I was taking Keith's advice. And when I look back on some of the artwork that I was doing for uh, Dungeons and Dragons at the time for Forgotten Realms and a few projects like that, uh, it was probably some of the weakest uh, commercial artwork that I ever did. Um, now the artwork was still, you know, it was accepted. Uh, it was still professional level but compared to either the work that I'm doing now or some of the other work I had done, uh, it was not my strongest work, but I had, to, I had to go through those years of working and trying to do more hand painting to get some of the skills that I, uh, that I can now bring to bear in my art. So uh, unfortunately, maybe some of that artwork uh, suffered. Uh, it wasn't great artwork. Uh, not all of it was, was certainly my best, uh, but that's, uh, that's the life of being an artist, and that's the way, that's the way it goes sometimes. Um, a lot of artists probably wouldn't be willing to uh, take that, that risk uh, of saying, hey, I, I got to step away from whatever my strongest thing is, um, but I'm very thankful to Keith for that advice uh, because it was very well-founded and uh, I've pursued and taken many workshops on oil painting. I've taken several watercolor workshops. Uh, I've signed up to take uh, a week-long workshop in Wyoming this year with 14 different instructors uh, who will pro primarily be teaching wildlife and Western art. And um, uh, I, I think a lot of professional artists don't do, they, they don't take time to invest them in themselves and take a week and go do a workshop and learn from somebody else. Uh, but I can honestly tell you, it's probably the best time and money you will ever spend. Uh, and the money, in my opinion, is easily recouped uh, in 
the, the art that you then create and sell. And for me, I took an art workshop from Mort Salberg last year and within a matter of months, I did some new style artwork that you can see on the art of Monty uh, which was some of my eagles and things like that. And not only has the majority of artwork that I've created in that style sold, uh, but it also landed me the cover of a very prestigious uh, art show in Arizona that I've been to the last two years. And uh, it's allowed me to branch out and to show more diverse looks. And, uh, and that's what I'm all about. I'm, I'm all about learning and becoming the, the best artist I can be. So that if a client comes to me and says, can you do a logo? Can you paint a mural? Can you paint a portrait? then the answer is always yes, I can do that. Um, speaking of which, Eric, if you're still watching, hopefully you are, uh, I didn't um, get back to you. Uh, yes, I do commissions. I, I'm not accepting any right now um, just because I need to get caught up on all the current obligations that I have, both commercial and with private commissions. That being said, I do plan on launching a Kickstarter in the fall and I'm gonna open back up for commissions of both drawings and paintings uh, in the Kickstarter. So if you can follow me on Kickstarter uh, and you're following me here obviously on Facebook, um, the best way to get a commission will be if I'm at a show that you're coming to, I usually will accept a few commissions, like maybe three or four, um, but uh, uh, if you want something that's more of, of like a, a painting or something along this caliber, uh, your best opportunity is going to be through uh, that Kickstarter for my Loco Hero comic, which is a, a, uh, a comic book based on a screenplay uh, that I wrote. I've written a number of screenplays. If uh, people follow me, they know that I, I work in writing as well. And so um, uh, it's, a, it's a project that I'm doing. I'm, I'm writing and and have created, but I'm not doing all the interior art. I'm actually hiring artists to do the interiors, and then I'll be doing some of the cover art, and then some of the, uh, uh, some of the variant covers will be provided by um, some of today's hottest artists, a lot of whom work for Coffin Comics as well, and I won't release any names yet on what some of those will be, but, uh, during that Kickstarter, you'll be able to, to find out. Uh, Doyle says, a master artist will strengthen what they're weak on and always challenge themselves in any form of art. Absolutely. You know, uh, I, I studied martial arts for uh, nearly 10 years, and I can remember one of the things that I remember uh, as, as a lesson is the, uh, and I don't know if Tyler's still watching because he's a martial arts master uh, as well, um, and, you know, the... the whether it's whether it's martial arts or not, it's the whole. You're coming over to the top of the hill, and or or the mountain. You reach the top of the mountain. Say that mountain is your first degree black belt, or you get your first commercial art, and you say, "Oh my gosh, I climbed to the top of the mountain." And when you get to the top of the mountain, you look over and you see an entire mountain range. You know whether it's the Rockies or whatever, and it's hundreds and hundreds of miles of other mountains. Well, that's, that's learning new stuff, whether it's sculpture or new techniques. But to learn that and to get to the top of that next mountain, you can't go from one to the top. You don't just get to walk across. You gotta go all the way down into the valley and you gotta basically become a white belt again. You gotta learn you know, airbrush or digital or whatever art form you're learning. And then you gotta get to the top of the mountain with that next art form. And um, so, you know, that's one of the stories that I remembered when I was taking martial arts that I loved about the the discussion about learning and, you know, being, trying to get good at something and then also being uh, humble of what you've learned, you know, the, the master or the, the, the piece of wheat that, you know, gets heavy and it, it's, it's bowed over and, you know, that's like knowledge and learning but it's also humility. And what I see today is, is a lot of young artists who are just starting out uh, and because of social media, they, you know, they think that 
uh, 100 likes equates to them being good enough to uh, make a living in today's market. And I think a lot of them are, are uh, in for a rude awakening when it comes to uh, getting jobs and being able to put food on the table uh, as more than a hobby because uh, they, they get these big giant egos uh, because they're like, oh man, look at my followers, look at my likes, I'm, you know, I'm awesome, people are buying my art left and right. Guys like me, Joe Jusco, Frank Cho, you know, we didn't grow up with having social media as an avenue. We did three or 400 shows and conventions uh, and we sat there for days and days and, and paid our own way doing that and there was only like six or seven shows in the entire country. There wasn't three in every venue. I mean, I can name five shows just in Colorado alone now. So the opportunities for today's emerging artists are a, a lot more than we had when uh, I was starting out 30 years ago. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of things that they have going for them that we never did. Uh, the problem is, is uh, a lot of them sort of don't understand the paying of their dues and if I was to tell them, look, you're probably not gonna get a whole lot of traction and be able to have the skills where you need till after about 10, maybe 20 years. And they're like, 10, 20 years, you kidding me? I'm awesome right now. Look at it, you know, people buy my sketch covers and you know, things like that. And you're like, that, that's great because we didn't, we didn't have those opportunities. But that, the problem is, is sometimes that means that they're not out there pushing themselves and learning to be better as an artist because they're they're kind of satisfied with what they're doing and they they only compare themselves to the other artists who are doing similar stuff they're not comparing themselves to the great artists of the world if you want to be truly great don't don't compare yourself to you know just people who maybe you're competing against with for dollars you need to compare yourself to the greatest artists ever in the world or in the industry, you know, uh, that's what keeps you humble and keeps you hungry and trying to learn new stuff. If you're like, well, you know, I'm pretty good compared to Bob, my neighbor or the guy over here, but I'm no Alex Ross. And you're like, well, so compare yourself regularly to Alex Ross or Frank Cho or, you know, Neil Adams or whoever your art heroes are. And that's what's going to make you go, well, how do I get you know, good like them. What did they do to, you know, uh, pursue their their career and their goals, and uh, try to follow in the in the footsteps of the greats, uh, if you wanna if you wanna have that kind of career. And fortunately, because of the social media and stuff, you know, there's you you can watch videos from Frank Cho. You can. Uh, watch me, you know, rant and, and do funny airbrush stuff. And uh, hopefully people learn from it because we didn't, we didn't have that. I can remember one time when people were asking about airbrushing and learn to do this. I had 36 books just on airbrushing alone. And I don't, you know, I don't look at any of those books anymore. And as a matter of fact, I've given most of them away and I've written some books of my own, but that's how I learned. I learned by just practice and looking at books for inspiration and reading about them. But today, sometimes people just want shortcuts. Hey, YouTube, or hey, can I learn this? Now, if there are opportunities and people wanna learn this stuff and guys like me do workshops, by all means, that is the fastest way you're gonna learn. And that's one of the reasons why I've invested thousands of dollars uh, of my own money in workshops from artists who I admire. So if you do have those opportunities, um, one of the best things that you can do is invest in yourself. And uh, I'm a big advocate of that uh, if you want to uh, learn the fastest. And then, you know, other than that, the only other shortcut I can think of is, oh wait, there are none. Yep, that's right, there's no shortcuts. You just gotta practice. And uh, you just gotta, put in the work. So hopefully you guys are being entertained by my ramblings here as I uh, use my little hand shields. I'm, I'm just kind of adding in some 
some color here and there. Probably gonna switch colors here in a minute. Uh, that way there's something more interesting for you guys to watch. And I don't wanna get too heavy with the blacks because she needs to stay, uh, obviously lights and whites and stuff. But I'm thinking maybe we should do some color uh, for the curtain. I'm thinking purple. I think purple would look cool as the, as the curtain. Josh says, thank you for doing these videos. As an art fan, it's always a pleasure to see the craft of the process. Well, you're welcome. Uh, similar to analogy I was given in high school sports, always play with or against better players you expect to improve. Yeah, the thing is, if you're playing racquetball um, and you always play against somebody who you can just whoop their butt and it's, you know, five to 20, well, guess what? The guy you're creaming is gonna be getting a heck of a lot better faster than you who might not have somebody who uh, is in your league. Now, if you step up and you say, hey, I wanna become better at this, and you sign up for a competitive racquetball league, and suddenly you're the guy who's just getting whooped by these guys who can pretty much lay the ball down on the court, um, that, that's when you're gonna get good. And so I absolutely believe uh, that analogy is, is the same. And maybe it's just because we're more we're more old school and we think, yeah, yeah, you know, play against somebody who's better than you. And you're like, well, yeah, but it's true. So, all right, so I'm gonna grab some violet here. And um, unless the paint says opaque on it, then that means it's a transparent color, which means as I'm laying over this, it's not gonna hide what's underneath. Now, let me see if I have an opaque. Yeah, I do. All right, so I'm gonna, let, let's compare the two bottles here. Okay, so the violet on the right just says violet. So that's gonna be a transparent color and I don't wanna hide anything. Now, if I was to use this opaque lilac, that means it's got white in it. And actually you could probably, let's hope I don't spill this. See how it looks like that there's white settled in the bottom of that? Once I shake it up, some of that's gonna go away and it's gonna fill up. I don't use a lot of opaque colors, but if I had to hide something and, or I, something got too dark, then yeah, I'd want to come over it with an opaque color. But at the moment, because I want to make this back here purple, I'm going to put some purple in there and then I'm going to put in a couple of drops of, of water just to thin it a little bit. Uh, you can also use uh, an airbrush binder, which is called a medium. That's supposed to help with the, the light fastness and the adherence to the paper. There's a lot of science that goes into art, um, but... Uh, uh, I don't always use those products. I don't, I don't know that I, I see a huge difference. It's supposed to help with a little bit of drying that you get of the airbrush on the tip, um, but I don't know. All right, I'm gonna make sure I move my drawings and my other stuff out of the way here because uh, I'm, about to, I'm about to lay down some purple and I don't wanna get it all over the place. So I'm gonna go ahead and stand up so I can get a little bit more over the art. I might end up being kind of close to the the old camera here, so it might get loud. Uh, okay, so I'm just gonna take my little hand shield here. I don't really need to worry about actually it coming over on the side of the illustration because that's just the edge of the illustration. So I'm just gonna abandon that for the moment. But I can do a little test, make sure my purple looks good. That's the color that I want. And, uh, and then I should just be able to, real softly, not all at once, Make sure that the paint is flowing and then just start moving in with this purple. And again, I can come back with whites. I can come back with yellows or oranges or other colors to um, uh, put back in highlights if I need to. But at the moment, I want this purple and this area back here to really recede. I just want it to just fade into the black, just like you would see on, uh, say, an oil painting. So uh, that it has subtlety and it has depth. And because I've already got a basically a full range underpainting, all of those blues and grays, they look like they're disappearing, but they're not. They're showing through my paint, but what I'm essentially doing is I'm tinting it. I'm creating another transparent layer. So this is just like Photoshop that is trying to simulate exactly what I'm doing, which is easy to do in Photoshop. You just adjust the transparency of the layer and boom, 
that color shows through, or in Photoshop, you would select color, and it would allow you to color something without actually changing what's underneath. And the more I build that up, like this area here, where it's you know real nice and rich, uh, it, it should have a lot of volume. It should feel a very three-dimensional, like that's a nice deep fold. And because I put in the time and the care to have a full value study underneath that, that you can see in literally probably a matter of two, three minutes, I can come in and I can just tint that whole uh, piece of uh, fabric there for my curtains and bam, I got purple curtains and they're looking good. And if I wanna make that a little more reddish, I can just come in with a more vibrant purple or a light magenta and I can just sort of kiss the edge of those areas that are closer to it. And uh, uh, my guess is hopefully it'll look kind of spectacular. Uh, okay, Sean, more airbrushing, looks awesome. <laughs> he says, I know it interferes with video recording, but do you not listen to music while you work? Um, actually, I mostly watch TV, and I know that sounds weird, but at the moment, Tombstone's on in the background. Um, but uh, I listen to TV and I, because you don't really, for a good TV show, you don't necessarily need the action parts. Uh, and so, uh, yes, if I wasn't doing live, and many times, if I'm into a show, I think, oh, I could do a live video. And then I'm like, nope, I'm, I'm into watching Gotham, or I'm watching whatever TV show, you know, Punisher, or Altered Carbon, or something really cool. Uh, and I mostly listen to them, and then I also do audio books. Right now I'm listening to an audio book on uh, Audible called The Art Forger. And it's all about the forging of this Degas. And uh, pretty interesting. It's practically an art history course in itself uh, because there's uh, it talks about so much about the science and great forgers like Han Van Muren and guys who spent you know six years just learning how to forge uh, artwork and things like that. It's kind of crazy. So, uh, Richie says, how big is this piece? Uh, I don't know if it's the angle of your arm or the relation to the camera, but it makes it look huge. Um, no, I mean, that's how, that's how big it is. It's 17 by 22 piece of paper. And so I would say that the original is probably more like 15, 14, 15 inches wide. Um, it's probably the biggest and, uh, it's kind of rare. I, I don't know anybody who right now who's, Hey, look, I spit on my art. Um, who's doing Lady Death covers uh, on a regular basis that is um, painting original art. Most of them you would buy a pencil or you would buy an ink. Uh, and that's it. And so, uh, I don't know, Jason Coates is watching. He owns a, a lot of my cover paintings from Lady Death and, and several La Muerta and things like that. Uh, but most of the originals... Uh, are this size. There's a couple that are more like 17 by 13, uh, but the bigger the painting, the more uh, detail you can put into them uh, without having to, you know, work under a microscope. And as we talked a little bit about earlier, because I'm not masking any of this off, I'm what they call freehanding this, which I know we've had discussions about that too. Pretty much all art is freehand. Unless I'm chaining my hand to the table. I don't know anybody whose art is not freehand. So I personally think that word should just be abandoned as, oh, look, it's freehand airbrushing. You're like, well, as opposed to what? Even if this was all masked off and I was using stencils, technically my hand is still free. So it's a pretty stupid term, uh, in my opinion. Uh, but the common term is, yeah, freehand airbrushing. Um, so... Uh, I think the, the curtains are making some, some pretty good progress. Uh, you guys can't see all of it. I think I've zoomed in a little. Maybe I can zoom back. Yeah, we can go back out a little bit there. Yeah. Um, yeah, that way you can see a little bit more of the edge. And it uh, uh, looks like I'm starting to run out of purple. Or maybe I have run out of purple. 
Mm, no, there's still some purple in there. Uh, you know, they're one of the things that uh, teachers will often tell you, at least one of the guys that, that I studied with, Frank Cavino, and he would say, you need to kill the corners. And that means don't have anything that's really bright or spectacular or focal point stuff over in the corner of your painting because that's going to lead the, your eye out of the painting. And so he was a big believer in that uh, old master's technique because that's pretty much what he taught. Uh, this can get a little bit curly. Maybe sagged a little bit. Oh, well, I'm not going to mess with it too much. Um, so at the moment when I'm, you know, working in the corner or something like that, I'm thinking to myself, okay, well, have I killed the corners? Have I made them dark and uninteresting so that your, uh, focus stays on, uh, where I want your focus to be on, which is, uh, usually if you're working in the sort of rule of thirds, you want it to be not dead center in the middle and you want it to be above or below halfway. And so this area right here, which would be the golden mean area of the piece, this is my focal point. It's not dead center. If you were an amateur artist, you would probably stick your head, the head right there, dead center in the middle, or maybe up a little bit. But um, if you subscribe to classic art techniques, uh, then uh, you can understand why uh, I have placed part of the figure the way they do. Now, that being said, a lot of time in commercial illustration, uh, it's it can often be sort of classic art principles be damned. Or maybe there's not even a, a, a background if you're just doing a single figure. And so you don't really have to worry about killing the corners or... Uh, exact placement, golden mean ratio, the rule of thirds. Uh, it, it's all basically the same sort of thing. And so um, you can uh, chuck some of those rules right out the window uh, because uh, you have commercial clients that say, nope, this is where it needs to be. Uh, Dave Torres got to run, watch this for, for sure. Right? All right, cool, appreciate it. Uh, so anyway, can you guys still see over here? Yeah, I'm just working on a little bit of the, the edge of the coat, um, or not the coat itself, but you know, this plate, this piece is primarily going to have a lot of blues and purples in it. And so later on, like say I'm working on the coat and I want to put some purple and I have some, I can just go ahead and just blend some of the purple right onto my black jacket because I want it reflecting the colors around me, just like her leg. Her leg could very easily have a little purple, a little blue coming right up reflecting from whatever's down here. So if I, if I make this red, I might want to put just a little bit of red color in there or uh, at this point I might decide she's going to have blue light coming in from one side above or below or coming down on the top from her and then I'm going to make all of those surfaces Say, say it's going to be a blue light coming down here. I'm going to come in with a, a radiant blue and I'm going to hit all those top surfaces and then I could use purples and things underneath. Knowing that uh, cool colors will always recede. I mean, if you want something to, to come towards the front of something, well then make it red or yellow because that's a hot color. But if you want it to go into the background or you want it to recede, then you use cool colors. And... Uh, that's just a little bit of, little bit of color theory. Now, I don't want to make all the curtains the exact same color because I think that wouldn't be very interesting. So I'm probably gonna switch to a red down here and uh, probably won't make the whole thing red because like I said, I wanna have some light coming down and hitting on some of these and I think I'm gonna make that uh, a blue light. Uh, Earl says, rock and roll and lady death. Life is more than good. Yep, you got that right, brother. Um, so I'm just going to finish up over here in this corner uh, and make this kind of back here uh, some of my same purple. And then by having that all be uh, kind of a solid darker color, it's going to help separate the, uh, the jacket from the background. Uh, by having just kind of a solid color there and it'll just separate a little bit. But again, I don't want you looking at this edge. I'm not going to put a bright white edge and a bunch of buckles and all sorts of stuff over there because 
then you'll get lost in that. And that's not where I want people looking. Um, and so I think I'm kind of probably done. Now I might, I might go pick up purple two, three times in this whole thing and come back and put in other areas. But right now I'm doing what I might call more like blocking in color and just working in kind of like larger areas. Plus it's also more interesting for you guys that are all watching. And so uh, I'll just go ahead and make my color run out here because I should be almost out of purple. And I'll just put any extra color over there in my corners uh, to make sure that, as I mentioned earlier, my corners are, are killed and they're not too bright. So uh, that should be it for just, just for the purple for the moment. Um, uh, let's see, how long have we been going here? I don't remember what time we this video started. Does this say how long I've been going? It's already 9.49. I don't know, was it 9 when I started? Anybody know how long this has been going? You can fill me in if you do. Um, so I'm gonna grab, uh, that's orange, I don't want orange, I want scarlet. And if I wanna darken my red a little bit, I'm just gonna put a drop of purple into the bottom and then I'm gonna add red over it. And uh, put a couple of drops in there. And then, let me see if I have the blender. Oh, I do. I can show you what this other product is over here if you're interested. Um, so this is Transparent Airbrush Extender. So this is supposed to uh, help the airbrush prevent tip drawing, uh, adhesion to the art surface that you're working on. Uh, oh, one hour and one minute. Wow, I have good timing. Uh, we'll go for another, another half hour and then we'll call it, we'll call it quits for the moment. Or maybe not. <laughs> oh man, we got a smart ass. Um, all right, for some reason my transparent airbrush extender has turned into like glue on the top here. The lovely part about art materials. All right, we'll put a couple of drops in there. So this should end up kind of a, a purplish red and uh, kind of swirl it around. I'll show you a technique, it's called back flushing. So hopefully you guys can see the cup here. And, oh, I'm just checking on my video. Okay, now, I'm gonna try not to ruin my art here. If I, let me see, make sure I'm doing this right. All right, so see the bubbles coming up there? This is called back flushing. And what I'm doing is, is I'm using air to actually blend the paint in the cup. You know, I could, I could use a brush or not or whatever, and then I test my color, and now I've gotten a nice kind of red with just a little bit of purple in it. Uh, from my little back flushing of basically blowing bubbles, making the airbrush blow bubbles in the cup. So that's kind of fun. And uh, so now I'm just gonna come into this section down here. And I always start in the darker areas and then work towards the light because you wanna save some of your lighter areas. And uh, I don't wanna get too heavy handed with the, I want the red to come into that area. Um, but I don't want it to sort of drown it. I want this to, at the, in the end, to look like a nice, rich, you know, dark, almost velvety red, but I also want it to be kind of almost black. And if I need to come back with a really, really dark red afterwards, uh, then that's uh, pretty easy to do, uh, or even um, some, you know, light oranges and yellows and things like that. And uh, uh, I can do the same thing over here. Hopefully this is showing up enough. Yeah, yeah, I guess you can, you can still kind of see it starting to turn red. And uh, again, if you need something to spray against, it doesn't matter if it's a piece of paper or whatever, but say I don't want some of this red bleeding onto my amp here and I want this to, to turn red fast, well then all I gotta do is, is just kind of hold that shield there and then just kind of lay it down kind of quick. And then I can come back into the darker areas and just make sure they're really saturated. They're really filled up with the red and it don't, doesn't end up looking too light or, or, or pastel. So I'll just lay some of the red in here. And if you get over spray or color, uh, if you're using these kinds of techniques, it's not a big deal because I can just come back later 
And if I need to hand paint in my the wheels on the bottom of the amp or uh, anything else, well, that, that's easy for me to do uh, with uh, any of the other tools that we were sort of discussing earlier. So um, I'm not going to put a lot of red into her at the moment, but to elaborate on my point, since I know I put some red down here, and I think it would be interesting to have some what we call reflected color. I can show you what a little bit of that would look like. And I don't want a bunch of it on my amp, so I'm just gonna come in here with my little hand shield. And just on the bottom of her foot, I'm just gonna put in just a little bit of red glow. And uh, it's immediately cool, I have to say. Uh, I dig it. And that's basically making it look like that this rich red carpet here is kind of reflecting up onto uh, her feet. And depending on how much of that, you you know, you could bring some of that up into the, the calf just a little bit, but you don't want to get too carried away because if it's reflected color, it's not going to have enough light or transparency to get up past there. You know, it's not going to reflect all the way up here into her head and her hair and things like that unless it's an actual light source. So, but it's not, it's reflected color. That, that color is coming up from light, hitting the fabric, and then reflecting that color onto, uh, onto the figure, which is, what, which is what light and color does. So, um, I think maybe for this last area, I'm gonna get rid of this red. And uh, again, I usually just keep something to, I'll blow the remaining color out, and then I'll just do a couple of um, flushes with cleaning solution, which in my case, my favorite is Windex. Uh, you can buy this stuff in stores uh, if you want, but I have not found anything that is uh, cheaper or superior than good old Windex. So um, don't don't buy the cleaning solutions at at uh, at stores if you're uh, if you're into airbrushing because uh, I think it's just a packaging scam. Uh, I haven't found anything that that's better, and honestly, I don't know too many people who have probably airbrushed more than I have. So. I hate to say it, but I probably know what I'm talking about. Anyway, good old Windex. That's all you really need. Uh, so it's pretty clean. At the end, after you've put some cleaning solution through the airbrush, it's a good idea just to take some water. Uh, there still might be some residual color, as you can see. And so if you're changing from something like a color to um, something that is not colored, like white, or in this case, a light gray or something similar, you probably want to just do a couple of extra rounds of flushing, which is what I'm doing right now. I kind of went back to the Windex and I'm pumping a bunch of it through it and then I'll go back to water. And I'll do that a couple of times because I'm going to go to a, a light gray right now and I don't want uh, a lot of that ex residual color that is trapped in the cup of the airbrush to end up tainting my color. And sometimes what you have to do, honestly, is put a little bit of whatever you're gonna paint and it'll get a little bit tainted and you just gotta run a little bit of it through the brush and that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to go to a gray number five, which is like a mid-medium gray and it should be great for airbrushing some of these tones and um, rather than black, which, you know, black can run away from you and get too heavy. And so um, I really like using a lot of the um, lighter gray colors and things like that because you can, um, you can blend smoother and um, get better gradients. So what we'll do is we've got these nice meaty calves down here staring at us. And uh, so I'm just gonna come into the same areas that already have shadow and I'm just gonna start adding subtlety. Now, Lady Death is, has white, pale skin, so if you get too carried away, you end up with too much grays in her, and then I'd have to like lighten her in Photoshop. So at this stage, I'm trying to be real careful and not getting too gray. And so, but I'm adding another layer of subtlety and, and heavier values uh, by getting that sort of nice blending going. And 
Uh, honestly, painting Lady Death is way harder, in my opinion, sometimes, than just painting somebody with traditional um, flesh colors. Uh, any Anybody's flesh, it doesn't really matter, but painting white, even though you get fun reflections and things like that, uh, you don't have all these other values to rely on. And so it can be a real challenge because if she's pure white, if you don't put enough shadow on her, shadows on her, um, well, she's boring. Because, you know, she's gonna look like, you know, a white sheet, a white ghost. So you're trying to find a nice balance between uh, the, the shading and still maintaining enough highlights. And, uh, you know, there, I'll admit, there's probably many times with Lady Death pieces that I've done that I'm having so much fun shading that I get too carried away with it and she ends up too dark. And then even once I scan in the art, sometimes I'll have to just play with a few little adjustments here and there and pump up the highlights to make sure she's still got enough whites. Um, now, she's actually gonna have stockings on and I haven't decided or whether I'll stick with the original sketch. And at the very end, once I'm done with all the shading, I'll come back and I'll add individually with the brush or with pencil I'll add all of the fishnets and that sort of thing. But uh, for this particular stage, I don't need those to be in my way. So I know enough to leave those uh, for the last. A step away from Silver Surfer. Um, Silver Surfer, I think, is, is easier to paint and cooler because chrome uh, has no color. It really just reflects what's around it. But you can get really, really dark. Um, uh, areas of uh, with the silver surfer when you're painting chrome and then do all sorts of stuff fun with reflections whereas uh, I can't decide if it, you know if she was made out of chrome or she was a Hajime Soriyama sexy robot I could come in and I could put in really cool fun reflections that are all kind of dark um, but you can't do that when you're talking about trying to paint this ashen white alabaster flesh uh, which again is, is, a, is a real challenge to do well uh, because you're constantly gauging uh, how much is enough when it comes to shadow and how much is too much. So for example, back here in her hips and her pelvis, the guitar is in front of it. And if she has, if I'm going to put, add a light source over the top of her, her pelvis area and her, and her abs and her stomach are very hidden. And so I can't have a lot of light hitting those, but I don't want to put them so much in shadow that uh, it, it all disappears because then she's going to end up with like this sort of black hole in her, her torso, uh, and her, uh, legs and stuff aren't going to look connected if I lose, uh, too much of that. So, um, these are, these are things that I'm always having to, to keep in mind. Uh, but I am having more fun these days with, uh, some of the uh, reflected colors and saying, hey, let's do a, uh, a blue light. And um, uh, I think my most successful cover last year for sales and popularity was called the Reaper Edition, uh, Lady Death cover. And um, uh, th there's very little of her and the character in that particular piece that's not in a colored light. And I basically did green from one side like the sort of real world side, and there was kind of a big green skull. And then there was, um, she was sort of being pulled at by these sort of hands from hell that were pulling her to the other dimension. And so all of the light that was coming from the backside was uh, reds and, and purples, and I used a color shift iridescent paint on part of it. And I just had a ton of fun with, um, painting that cover and it was kind of a risk for me because it's it's very non-traditional with its colors and uh, not only the fans but Brian told me it was one of their their best sellers and and I felt very sort of vindicated with my color choices on that particular piece um, you'll see you know I got a little bit of almost like a wound there the um, the trigger is kind of digging into my finger and so sometimes I put a, a finger cover like a librarian would have because of the way I hold the brush. 
And this brush was designed basically to be held like this. But for several reasons, I actually hold it like this. And for one, traditional airbrush, the, fig the trigger was always up here on the top and you press down. So to me, to hold an airbrush, this is very natural. Second reason is, is two fingers are better than one in these, but two fingers in particular love to move together. You'll notice on your own hand, they always wanna to stay together. And so by having one in the front and one in behind, I'm actually doing sort of this micro pull and I actually have more control because I have a stop finger back here. And so I have a lot more control. The problem is, is I kind of end up um, kind of wearing a hole in my finger uh, at times. And so a lot of times what I'll do with uh, that particular finger is, is I'll put a, uh, a couple of uh, covers uh, on uh, for long periods of airbrushing. And then now you can see that won't dig in there. I told the, the manufacturer that I thought that they should dip the trigger in... Uh, in a kind of a soft rubber, uh, which of course they never took my advice, but uh, I might just get some of that Plasti dip and, and dip the trigger myself, but I also don't want it to become too fat. I, want, I still want to have that, be able to feel the, the control and the back and the forth of the, of the subtlety of the trigger. And uh, so for the moment, I just primarily use, I use a little finger trigger guard there. Um, so you can see I'm just kind of moving my way up. I'm putting some color into the guitar. And this will have some, some soft blues and purples airbrushed into it too as well. And then at the end, I'll come back with white paint and pencil and I'll pop all these edges uh, back to the surface and it, you know, add like highlights and things like that. And it'll look like a, you know, shiny chrome, you know, kind of looking ax, hopefully. So. I need to come back in and add some grays on the underside of her elbow there. Just softly. Again, it's all, it's all subtlety. And uh, you can see, hopefully, from the difference of where we started an hour, hour and a half ago, that she's just starting to get a little more subtlety. So I hit this area right under here and added a little bit more of a drop shadow to that arm. And... Uh, again, maybe it still hides part of the art uh, or cleavage and whatnot, but it, it adds more realism and dimensionality to the art. Just like this shadow here under the hair, now she's got that hair starting to come forward because it's creating a cast shadow on her uh, kind of armpit area here, the, the starting of the, the breast. And so I'm gonna add that shadow there and some of these other areas can kind of be dropped back a little bit if they're too, what we call too hot, if it's coming too far forward. And right now I can drop part of the center part of the cleavage and just let light hit kind of that part there. So uh, this color will also be good for the hair and adding some of the um, shadow areas. I used a little bit of black earlier, but um, again, this. This gray has a tendency to be softer. It's kind of like painting with like a dove gray. And um, uh, I can just sort of soften some of those edges. And, and I gotta be real, you wanna be real careful. I mean, this is your, this is the money part of the illustration. It's gotta look like her. And you don't want these shadows to uh, run away with the art, even though you could fix it if you needed to. Uh, why, why fix it if you don't need to? So I want her uh, uh, I want her features to just be, you know, a strong but feminine jawline, a nice shadow on them. But uh, I, you know, I want the the blend that are happening in the uh, cheek and things like that to be, you know, really porcelain. Sugru would be a good choice for that trigger, especially if you want to customize it for your fingers. Uh, I don't know what that is, so if you could message me what that is, uh, I would appreciate it because I always love to learn about new stuff. I don't know if Sugru is a, a brand or if it's like Plasti Dip uh, or, or what it is, uh, but that would be great if you could send me information on that.
Hey, Kevin Elman, Aquaman. What's shaking, my friend? We're doing a little airbrushing here on Lady Death. This is for the uh, Coffin Comics exclusive for San Diego Comic-Con. And Kevin and Sharon are coming out to uh, uh, San Diego with me this year. Longtime friends of mine and uh, comics collectors. And Kevin owns quite a few originals and sketches from uh, a lot of luminaries in the industry. He's got probably the most significant Aquaman collection in the world. Am I allowed to say that, Kevin? Too late. Sorry, bud. <laughs> I spilled the beans. You're a big Aquaman collector. Uh, Rich says, it's a moldable silicone glue. Good evening, Kevin. I'm glad you could join us. A moldable silicone glue. Yeah, that might be interesting. I might be down with that. So um, uh, if you have a link for whatever that is online, I wouldn't mind uh, checking that out so I can learn a little more about it. So, yep, starting to get some depth. You know, and, and honestly, this, uh, this illustration, because I had some other obligations, I was trying to get some of the uh, Fiend Fest commissions done and a few things like that. Uh, I always try to balance my time, even if I'm putting in, you know, sort of 50 and 70 hour weeks as normal, um, that uh, somebody just need to get into that next phase. And uh, honestly, I did, I had this phase of this particular Lady Death uh, in the phase that you saw it in for about two weeks. And I hadn't worked on it. And I have some other projects still this evening that I've got to get to, so I will be setting this aside shortly. A lot of times that's good because uh, you'll come back to something maybe a couple of days later and you'll notice something that bothers you, whether it's an idea for coloration or whether it's uh, a subtlety or it's an anatomy problem that stands out uh, with you then um, uh, it's good to uh, be able to, to set those things aside and then just c come back to them. And um, uh, so I'm a fan of that, even though a lot of times with commercial illustration, uh, especially when you have tight deadlines, you, you often don't get that luxury because it's like, hey, this is due Thursday. We need it Thursday, we're not kidding. And uh, I have missed very, very few deadlines in my life and career. I'm not gonna say I haven't missed any, but uh, very few, I would say less than 1%. Um, but uh, if, if you can get done ahead of time and you can let something sit, then before you have to scan it and send it off to your client, then it gives you the ability to review it, let it sit for a little bit, maybe you decide to change something or you realize you forgot to sign it or something and go, oh, yeah, I need to make this little change. Or if they really need it on Thursday, maybe don't show them on Thursday evening uh, to see if it needs any changes. Or if they said, hey, we told you Harry Potter was supposed to be in a red robe, not a green robe. Then if you show it to them on Tuesday or Wednesday, you have time to make that change and still not miss your deadline. And then the art directors have a tendency to like you a lot more because you're making their life easier instead of harder. Since the movie, I'm not embarrassed anymore. Oh, <laughs> uh, we were talking about Aquaman. So yeah, uh, yeah, I, I have my copy right here in the studio. I watched it a couple of times uh, since and I saw it a second, a second time in the, uh, in the theater uh, when I was down in Arizona. So uh, Kevin and I are both uh, big Aquaman fans. And actually, I even went to the gym today and, and you know, swam for half an hour. So I was kind of getting my Aquaman on by, uh, you know, getting some exercise in Aqua style. <laughs> so for those who are joining kind of late at the moment, I just have some light gray in here. And this is the first... Uh, these are the first colors and stages of airbrushing and it's over layers of colored pencil that are then blended with markers. And so this evening we did some purple, did some red, and then right now I'm just doing some light grays. 
on. And because it's pretty bright in here and I realize that this is online, you're probably not seeing some of the subtlety that uh, I actually get with um, here in the studio because there's a really bright white light that's coming down over this. So uh, it, it's blowing out some of the subtlety that would be uh, easier for me to see. Plus you're actually only watching it at like 72 DPI, you know, screen res. Uh, so you're not, you're not getting the, the, the subtlety. So sometimes when I'm airbrushing, it probably looks like I'm not doing anything. Uh, but I assure you that every time I take airbrush to, uh, to paper here, which is an illustration paper, I am putting down paint. I am ejecting paint from the airbrush and I'm creating layers of hopefully subtlety and shadow. And then later on, if when I do the final layers, I will come back with hours and hours of hand painting and highlights and I will bring back some of the bright highlights back to the forefront. So, oh, you got a link for me, cool. Lots of people use it to customize and soften handles. I've used it on additional corner bumpers to my phone cases. Ooh, I like that idea. And I drop a lot of stuff. You can ask anybody. I am a gigantic klutz when it comes to dropping stuff. Uh, I, I, I have gone through a few phones and I have deep sixed a few phones in lakes. Uh, not that having a rubber handle would help, but I do like the idea of added bumpers, rubber baby buggy bumpers on my phone. Uh, since I use the phone a lot for videos and such. So, uh, what time frame are we at now? Can somebody tell me if this is like, if we're, are we around an hour and a half? Because I probably, I don't want to have the video go too long. But, uh, because then sometimes I just turn it into a speed video, but I am actually making a time lapse of this entire session as a separate thing. Um, so that being said, there will be separate videos, uh, but you won't be able to hear commentary. So if you want to be able to hear the commentary, uh, you need to um, uh, go back and watch the saved video. You won't be able to interact or ask questions, but you can watch the video anytime you want. So add just a little bit of shading to the top of the neck of the guitar. And probably what I'll do is, is, you know, I might even change the color of the neck or maybe this guy up here, instead of being white, you know, maybe I'll make it more blues or reds. And that'll allow, visually it'll help separate from her hair. Right now, um, you know, it blends in a little bit and it's not so separate, but if I were to make this a color against her uh, white skin, or if I was to make the guitar red, which I could still do anytime I want, um, then it would really make that pop. And so those are all considerations that I have to do and decide on uh, when I do that. Say that five times fast. Uh, 126, okay, so yeah, I'm gonna wrap it up here in a couple minutes because um, I need to switch gears and uh, uh, work on some other projects, but uh, I will try to get more into doing some regular uh, uh, Facebook live videos and other sessions. Uh, hopefully they won't be too late for some people, but uh, let's face it, I'm Batman and you know, these are like night hours and that's when artists like to thrive and uh, when you know, there's better TV on. <laughs> I guess it doesn't really matter anymore because we all have like Netflix and Amazon Prime and all that sort of thing. We don't have to worry about, oh man, this is like crappy TV time. Um, so I'm going to pour out my paint there. And I think what I'll do is, is uh, since we don't have to worry about this uh, getting uh, out of skew, I'll bring the, the camera down a little closer uh, to the art. And then that way you guys can see a little bit more of the details. And then we'll just wrap it up and turn it off. And uh, you can return to your regularly scheduled lives of awesomeness. Okay, so airbrush is cleaned out. I'm going to set that aside over here. And uh, I'm going to separate my art here and then I'll hold it up to the camera and we'll do a little pan and scan. And uh, hopefully you'll be able to see some more details. So. Let's kind of bring this up here like this so you'll be able to see um, some of the softer grays in her face. And you want it to be, you know, you want the shadows 
and the blending to be really, really smooth. So you don't want speckles and spatter paint and things like that. You want all of the different techniques to be working in harmony. And so that uh, there's texture where you want texture, it's smooth where you want it to be smooth, say on her leg, things like that. But the bottom line is, is I'm trying to create a piece of art. I'm not trying to create a photograph, nor am I trying to mimic a photograph. Uh, these guys who are human copy machines who just see a photograph and say, look, I, I drew every single crack and every single line. Um, to me, that's not art. You, you're not imparting any of your own personal uh, style or influence in the piece. And so uh, as much as it impresses the crap out of the regular world, the older I get as an artist, the less that that impresses me because um, they're, they're not bringing something new. All they're doing is duplicating somebody else's work, a photograph that somebody else captured. So um, there you go. There's a little bit of a pan and scan on the original art. And uh, uh, hopefully you guys learned something. There you go. I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a view of the studio here just because that will be kind of fun. And uh, some people haven't seen some of the videos here. So, hey, look. I have a motorcycle in my studio, it's true. And I painted that one too, there's my Ducati. All right, so we've got some cool pinup art on the wall here. Uh, over here, this is some art I did for Barrett Jackson. There's the, the, this one here. Uh, that was for Barrett Jackson, you can see that there. Uh, this is one of my uh, pieces of Western art. This one's actually sold. And I just have some other cool stuff around, there's a clock. Uh, here's a, a signed piece. Of, this is a print I got like 25 years ago from Julie Bell, who signed it for me. And a little bit of inspiration. Of course, we got some, some Pale Rider up there. And uh, my mom got me this. This is cool. This is an original. It's not an original. It's a print. And it's from Vargas from Esquire. And this year was 1946. So that's right out of the pages of Esquire from 1946. And as you know, I'm a big fan of uh, pinup art, so that's kind of cool. And then uh, over here, we've got some more art pieces. You got a Frazetta, a little sculpture right there. And then this is a little print of one of my pieces of auto art. Um, but if anybody's been watching some of my Western art, as I said, I, I've been letting this piece just kind of sit here on the wall. It's not in a frame yet. And I'm just seeing if there's anything else I want to do to it uh, before I put it in the frame. And so right now it's just sort of tacked up on the wall, but I really like this horse right here. He's probably like my favorite part of that. So, oh, and then down here, this is a, this was a Rockies piece that I did this year. That's a Bluetooth speaker. I have some of those available that just say spring training without the Rockies girl. And then uh, uh, I have the Rockies version. And then here's some more of my Western art. A bunch of it's off the wall right now because it's in storage, but there's a, uh, Wind in his hair from Dance with Wolves. And then of course, you gotta have a life-size Han Solo and Carbonite to watch over you here in the studio because that's just what I do. Uh, here's one of my sculptures, this is a bronze. And uh, there's gonna be a big announcement soon about where this is going and and uh, that, but I can't, I can't make that announcement yet. There's a couple other sculptures down here. There's a, a couple of steel buffalo that I, uh, welded and ground. I made those when I was in my 20s. Uh, this is a cool fish. Uh, there's also a welded sculpture and then here's another one of my bronze CSU rams. Did you move the studio to the basement? No, this is actually out in the garage. You look over there, see there's actually like cars in there. This is the, this is the outer garage studio. There's a Batman piece that I did that was a collaboration. That one's actually sold. Uh, my buddies and I caught that fish about 25 years ago when we were off the coast of Mexico. And then you got part of the, some of the man cave decor here. There's my little work section. And you can see my big arm right there that holds uh, some of the art. And uh, this is cool over here. This is a, uh, believe it or not. So I had this, this uh, case made, it's cool. Hold on, I gotta show you this. So this is, this, is my, this is my cabinet, and uh, I had this cabinet made, and believe it or not, what's inside is a compressor. And so this is, a, if I need the big air tools or I need compressor stuff from my garage, 
rather than having a big, giant, ugly Craftsman compressor sitting next to me, I had this awesome steampunk cabinet. It was custom built to fit it, and I found that guy on Etsy, and I had him build me that cabinet. It's kind of awesome. Uh, this is my artwork chest where I can take to shows if I need to. And so this is all labeled with different stuff, oil paints and watercolors. So I converted a, 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 a chest uh, to, to art stuff. And there's a heat press, and that's one of my printers where I can do dye sub stuff. Uh, this is cool. There's some more signed stuff. Uh, that's uh, Boris Vallejo, so good old silver surfer that Boris signed for me like 25 years ago. And then, of course, you've got the Rocketeer. I love this sculpture. I got this many, many years ago from Wayne Winsett over at Time Warp. I bought that. I always loved the Rocketeer and the Art Deco style. Hey, Kevin, since I know you're watching, bam! There's Aquaman. He's ready to be watched at a moment's notice. Uh, here's one of my early precasts of the Ram. This is cast in uh, 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 a product called Forton, and that's before you cast it in bronze. And then, uh, of course, if you didn't think my printer was big enough, that's actually a printer. It's about four feet wide, uh, prints up to 24 inches wide, weighs like 250 pounds. I'm actually getting his big brother here uh, this week, uh, getting a new one. And then, of course, the Marshall Amp. Did you think that was a Marshall amp? Oh, nope, it's not. It's actually the beverage fridge of the Marshall amp. So you've got, you know, beer and water at a moment's notice if you need to have a, libra a, a libation or entertain your, uh, your clients that are over. So there you have it, there's part of the studio. There's a big old flat file over here. And uh, that's where I have lots of, oh, lots of art and paper over the years. Down here we got another, this is one of my pieces of mountain man art, pencil drawing, that's uh, waiting to go in a, a frame there soon. So there you go, you get a little bit of a little bit of a tour. There's a couple of books over here that I did uh, remarks in. I need to get these uh, shipped out. No, that's just the floor. Oh, there's a remark. So a little hand drawn, Lady Death in that book. And then one more. Monty Moore, that is, over here. Those are waiting to go out to fans and get shipped out, so. All right, I think I'm gonna uh, wrap it up and sign off. Epson for the win, that's right. Epson makes awesome printers. And, uh, oh, well, you got some other fun stuff over here. Let's see what's on the wall. This was a news release from Playboy, and they were one of the first ones to coin and says, Playboy licensing gives you more. They were, they were one of the first ones to kind of do that with my last name. And let's see what year that was. Uh, is there a date on that? Blah, blah, blah. 2003. Huh. Look at that. That was a while back. Uh, this was uh, Penthouse Magazine. This is one of the motorcycles that I painted that was in a, a biker build-off. Then this was uh, Bud Plant. Cover of Bud Plant with the Art of Wench. And we did our game. Uh, there's a couple of motorcycle features in magazines that I did the art of. And then probably the best custom paint bike show back when I was doing a lot of uh, motorcycles. And uh, I won best artwork at the custom paint show up in uh, up at Sturgis. So there you have it. Oh, and back to the Ducati, uh, which I actually did all this. So these uh, pieces that are painted on there, those are not stickers. And if you were to be able to look at it, you know, from the side, you'd tell that there's not a single ridge or anything like that. And so I painted all of those on there, on my Ducati. That's a 19, what is that, 1990, yeah, 750 Super Sport. There you go. And because it's just such a cool piece of art, it keeps me company here in the studio. So, all right, there you have it, folks. I'm gonna sign off. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, hey, look, there's Tombstone in the background. Told you. And uh, we'll catch you on the flip side. Thanks for watching, everybody. Feel free to share this and also follow me on Kickstarter. You can follow any of my pages on Facebook, Mind's Eye Games, Loco Hero. I've got stores on eBay, on Amazon. Uh, I'm sure I'm not even thinking of most of it. On MavArts, on Instagram. Uh, my website is Mavarts or Maverick Arts. You can look up all that stuff or find it online. Uh, let me know if uh, 
Do you have any questions? I think I hate him. You better not be talking to me, Pops. I'll kick your butt. <laughs> all right. We will see you all on the flip side. Talk to you later. Peace out.